Hello listeners, Mark here. Just a reminder in case you've forgotten since last week that Laura's audio might not be as good as it usually is during this episode due to technical difficulties during the recording. However, hopefully it should sound quite a bit better than last week thanks to the efforts of community hero Joe Ressington. Thanks, Joe. Welcome to Season 8, Episode 10 of the Ubuntu Podcast. In this episode, we're going to be discussing Snappy. If you don't know what that is, keep listening. We'll also have some command line love, and we'll go over your feedback. I'm Laura, and joining me this week are Alan. Hello, hello. How are you? Martin. Hello. <laughs> and Mark. <laughs> hello. Hello. In no particular order. In no particular order. <laughs> um, so, yes... Good. Thank you, Samantha. Um, so, <laughs> what have we been up to since last time? Um, Mark? Uh, I've been running Cyanogen OS 12 on my phone, which just updated this week. Is that your one phone? My OnePlus One phone. That's yes. two phone. Um, it's been yeah. it's my two phone. Yeah, it came running Cyanogen Mod. 11 okay and it's now updated to cyanogen os 12 and how not much is, is it based on, um much the same as i mean it's based on it's based on uh android lollipop so it's got the newness of that other than that it's broadly similar to to um cyanogen mod 11 was um although it's got a few additional features there's an interesting looking one called baton which is um or baton um, which is a tool for if you've got several devices running Cyanogen, you can log into um, Baton on all of them, and it can, it'll not only back up your data for each of your apps, but you can also share the state of an app between devices. So you can be running an app on, say, your phone, and you could send the state of that app to your tablet, and it'll just carry on running on your tablet. Wow, this is like Jack Bauer in 24 saying, yeah, send it to exactly, my screen. Yeah, send it to my screen. Awesome. Yeah, which looks really cool. The only thing is, it doesn't really tell you anything about, um, is it encrypting your data? Where's your data going? Or anything like that. So until I can find out something about that, there's, I'm not signing up for it, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and is this a Cyanogen service? It's a, no, it's a partnership between Cyanogen and a company called Nextbit. Okay, they provide Baton. Yes. Right. Cool. But it's, it's exclusive to Cyanogen. Cool. At the moment. Martin, what have you been up to? Uh, well, I did make it to the Egg and Raspberry Jam a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and I met Albert, the organiser, who was rather brilliantly uh, demonstrating his uh, mind reader on Ubuntu Mate for the Raspberry Pi 2, which uh, put a big smile <laughs> on my face. Brilliant. And I also met Joe Ressington there from every other podcast, and uh, <laughs> he, uh, he's been doing some interviews, so I'm sure you'll find out all, all, all that happened at the Egg and Raspberry Pi Jam from uh, the Linux Luddites in an upcoming show. And in other Raspberry Pi related news, I've exchanged some emails with uh, Eben Upton, and by the time you hear this, you should be able to download Ubuntu Mate for the Raspberry Pi 2 from the Raspberry cool. Pi website, which is terrific. Nice. nice. Excellent. That's really good. Okay. Awesome news. What about you, Alan? Uh, I've been playing Windows games on Linux. Mm. Um, what have you been using to do that? Uh, Steam. I used, I didn't even know. Heretic. Well, I knew it existed. <laughs> yeah. Whatever. I, uh, I knew you could, uh, you could play this, you could do this kind of game streaming from one machine to another. Oh, and I my, see. My yes. Windows machine, which has some Windows games on it, um, yes. happened to be switched on at the point when I launched Steam on my Linux box. Yes. And the Linux and box said, said connecting yeah. to your Windows machine. And I thought, what, what, what? And, on my Linux machine, I clicked stream on a Windows game. It happened to be GTA 5, uh, which isn't available for Linux. And I was playing on my Linux machine, streaming from my Windows machine. And it was brilliant. Wow. Mm. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's really cool. So it's quite a nice way to play, you know, for, for games that are not available on, on uh, Linux, you know, have a Windows machine somewhere on your network with Steam running, uh, with your collection of games on, and uh, you can run them on any of your Linux machines that have also got Steam. That's quite cool. The other thing I find it useful for is uh, if you've got one machine, which is your gaming rig with all of the graphics, then uh, and you can just use a whatever laptop somewhere else in the house and just stream it with all the performance from your big right. gaming rig. Yeah, there's no way my laptop would be able to play GTA 5 at 1080p, but actually yeah. it can because it's streamed from another machine that actually has the grunt to be able to do it. So, yeah. How about you, Laura? What have you been up to? I got three whole minutes off my parkrun personal best time last Saturday. Wow. How long does it take to do a parkrun then? Uh, it used to take me 34 minutes 13, and last week it took me 31 minutes 13. Wow. Are you using some a- app, some technology to track this? Or um, an old school style stopwatch that your sports par- teacher would well, have had. Parkrun track it officially. I use Strava, um, the service itself, to trace the GPS trace of where I've been. But the timing on that isn't great because I start and stop it at funny times and stuff. But um, that's the official times that Parkrun give us. Excellent. Well done. Thank you. Should we get on with it? Let's. Yes. <laughs> So this week uh, we're recording uh, on the 5th of May and this is the start of uh, the Ubuntu Online Summit, which is the virtual online uh, version of the Ubuntu Developer Summit that we used to have in person. And uh, Mark Shuttleworth gave his pre-Ubuntu Online Summit uh, keynote yesterday on Monday. Um, And if you didn't see it, it's available on YouTube. We'll link to it in the show notes. Um, and in it, he gave a uh, kind of state of the nation and uh, uh, plans or some high level plans for 1510 and 1604 and also uh, put out some other uh, calls to action and uh, thought we should um, we should probably talk about this. So, Mark, you sat and watched it, didn't you? I did. Yes. So the first well, he started with it with a small presentation about uh, Ubuntu Snappy, mm. which is this this new uh, version of Ubuntu where you have sort of like bits of the system in isolated chunks which plug into other bits of the system um, so you have like a kernel bit and you have a core OS bit and then you have apps on top of that um, rather than having you know, the traditional package manager that we we know and love uh, so he was talking quite a lot about this and how it's um, being targeted at um, embedded developers so people um, the kind of people who make things like DDWRT for routers apparently are quite interested in this because um, it provides a way of having the sort of the core system bit um, easily standardized across lots of devices and then just having like the kernel bit specified for each device. And then you can easily update the bit in the um, that does all the OS stuff and that does the app stuff separately. Um, which is quite a compelling use case for them by the sound of it. It sounded to um, me like it was basically ubuntu running the or like underlying the internet of things in a consistent and secure way yeah basically yeah because you've got this this one sort of uh, you've got this ubuntu snappy image mm. which can then just plug on to whatever hardware enablement bit you need for your specific device i suppose and then there's other companies apparently like uh, printer companies you mentioned thinking of running ubuntu on their printers which would be cool mm. Yeah. So is that how we get to the 200 million users? Is we're in every printer <laughs> and in every drone and yes. uh, router and, a, <laughs> and Ubuntu on every desktop? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> and and every fridge. Yeah. So uh, so the the interesting um, there are many interesting things about about Snappy and there's lots of misconceptions and lots of um, worry in the community, uh, wider community about Snappy. Did he did he talk a little bit about? Um, snappy and desktops and not just the 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 iot stuff but the like traditional desktop as well um a lo- i think a lot of the desktop stuff he mentioned was more about the the convergence side of things um he may have met, he may have talked about snappy on the desktop but i i the mo- more stuff that caught my ear was about um the well the fact that it's on it's it's going to be the way the phones are uh are working they're they're migrating from click packages to snappy and then they're going to converge so your desktop will be running on that system as well yeah 
Is it just make? Is it part of this whole thing to make it more secure? Like I think, isolating well, that's things. That, well, that's part of it. I mean, uh, he he did mention. I I saw the first half of it. I was busy working for the rest of it. But it in he did mention that part of the compelling argument for Snappy over Debian packages, for example, is at the point when you install a Debian package, the person who made that package, um, to invoke a phrase that he used once, has root on your machine. <laughs> oh, so. Yes. You know, they, the maintainer scripts that are run as a Debian package is installed run as root and can touch any file, uh, on your file system. And we, you know, we depend on the people who made those packages not to mess that up. But equally, users don't necessarily want, uh, some random application they install from the internet to have root over their device. Maybe they want to have that confined. And I think that's part of what click packages give you. And then that's extended with snappy packages is that each app is confined and it can't go outside that confinement. So yes, there is a, there is an element of security in there along with some other, and some other um, benefits. I as listened well. to the snappy desktop um, uh, talk today in UOS. And the other key difference that hadn't, I uh, hadn't twigged is that snappy packages don't have to be as discreet as packages are currently. So at the moment, for example, you might um, install Apache as a package and you might install MySQL as a package and, or MariaDB and PHP as a package. But snappy packages could be all of those things together as a... a, a uh, a chunk of things that all come together. So um, the talk today was about um, the desktop next and using snappy packages to deliver the desktop. And effectively, the base Unity environment would be a whole package which sits on top of snappy core. So instead of installing each of the different packages that make up that desktop environment, you just install something called Unity 8 point one and you get all of the necessary bits that make up that desktop environment and then maybe you just have um snap packages for the applications that you add on top of that for things like firefox and LibreOffice. and if you take that out to um the server space um the best example i've been able to think of is um if you've ever had to install um zimbra um that is a collection of debs and each deb has a number of bits of functionality and those include multiple applications. So actually Zimbra would be a good candidate to be a snap package where it's this big uh, amorphous blob of several different applications working in consort. And then you get the atomic updates forwards and backwards. So if your update breaks your application, you can roll back to the previous point release and restore the the application to how it was working before. And I think the goal with these is also that it's not just the application that gets rolled forward and back, but the data as well. So if you upgraded and as part of the upgrade, it modified loads of data and that broke, you could roll back and undo those changes to the data along the way. So it wouldn't, upgrading doesn't, isn't a one way path. You can, you can undo the, the upgrade as well. Yeah. There was a, an interesting thing that he mentioned actually the, about adding the uh, the ability for um, for apps to test themselves so that they can check if an update worked and if not then they can roll themselves back rather than you having to find out what went wrong and do it yourself. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, Sounds and there's cool. the, one of the other um, features they he talked about was the well, I'm not sure he talked about it, but I saw it in one of the sessions today was about the A B. Uh, so you actually have, uh, you know, if you have a system update that, that updates the underlying core, you actually have two partitions, one with the current running version and one with the new version. And when the new version is installed, it flips across to the other partition, but keeps the older one there. So in the event that the new one is broken, it'll flip back and reboot into the old version so that you're not left in a broken state. I think the goal is that you never you never end up with an update breaks your system because it can always roll back the entire system or roll back the application and the data that was broken 
Wow. So you, it, forward isn't the only direction you can go. You know, you at the moment, um, if you if you're on fourteen ten, for example, and you upgrade to fifteen oh four, and as a result of upgrading to fifteen oh four, that breaks your workflow somehow. Um, you know, the only way you can go is fix that bug or reinstall from scratch and lose everything. You know, you could you could try and fix the bug or move forward to like fifteen ten or you know some patch that's you know, in the future. But with this, you could you can roll back until it's safe to roll forward again. So you've talked about the AB there, and I suppose an important thing to point out, because uh, until today when I listened to the presentations, I w- wasn't completely clear on what Ubuntu Core and what Snappy was and why it was Ubuntu Snappy Core. So Ubuntu Core is basically a base <laughs> operating system, right? It's the, the kernel and all of the necessary gubbins that make a core operating system. In much the same way as Core OS is doing things at the moment, I think it's fair to say. Would, would you agree with that? Um, I I don't know much about Core OS and how how they do it, but it's it it's similar mm. in there that it's a very very minimal mm. install. Um, but it's and on top of that, yeah, you put your your snaps that can contain individual applications or a suite of applications, like you said, like Zimbra yeah. would be a suite of applications. Um, or a whole desktop environment, but the the or a whole desktop environment. But and and one of the things that uh, was mentioned was that yes, there will be this snappy desktop, the snappy core desktop, which will feature Unity eight, and it's the future of um, Ubuntu Next, as we call it, like the next generation of the Ubuntu image that you might download and install. Um, but the key the the key thing that a lot of people have been worried about was well what does that mean for me who's running 1504 or you know when i get to 1510 what happens to me do i suddenly switch to unity 8 and i you know lose my unity 7 favorite things or you know applications that that required something in unity 7 that is no longer there in unity 8 for example and he said um that the community would decide when unity 8 becomes the default desktop so yeah it, that it, was it, interesting he, yeah i didn't i didn't because he said basically somebody somebody he, he did like a q a bit at the end and somebody said will unity 8 be the default in 1604 and he said no and then he said the community will decide i didn't know whether he meant if the community says yeah we really want unity 8 to be default in 1604 it will be or whether that meant that he'll wait until the community think it's ready and then the next release it will be default. I think it's more... Um, so, do you? Re- I don't know if you remember last season, or it might have been the season before, we interviewed Mark yeah, on the I phone. I do remember that. And he, I remember him saying, quite up, being quite upfront about the fact that Unity... Um, we, we may have been a little bit too aggressive in putting Unity as the default desktop when we did. Yeah. Um, and you know, we won't make that mistake again in the future. And I think that's that's a callback to that, is the, the Unity 8 decision is to not make that same mistake again. Um, and when he says when the community thinks it's ready, I think what he's looking for is for people to tell us, you know, what they need out of Unity 8 and to help steer it in the right direction. You know, what, to what define actually, what ready is. Yeah, exactly. Because, you know, we know what our use cases are and, you know, we, we can, we can list out what we think many of the use cases are, but there are people out there who have interesting and strange uses for Ubuntu and, you know, the Linux desktop in general. And there may be some compelling reason why their, you know, installation of 50,000 desktops can't move to Unity 8 because of, you know, whatever reason that might be. And we need to know about those things because we don't want to push Unity 8 on people when it clearly isn't ready for every possible use case. But then it's never going to be ready for every possible use case, is it? So isn't this a sort of, you know, how long is a piece of string? Well, well when I mean, the community it, says it's ready, they're never all going to say it's ready, are they? No, I think I think he wants broad consensus. I, I, I don't want to, like, try and... Um, guess what his, <laughs> you know, definition of what the community deciding is. But I think, you know, I think what he's getting at is we won't just go splat. You've got Unity 8. 
yeah. is what he's getting at. What would make okay. sense is rather than going, saying, are you ready yet? And the community goes, no, no, no. Okay, we'll wait another one. It sounds like it's more of a, if you, if you define what you want out of it when, we, right. when we've done it, then it's going. Right, we need some criteria. Yeah. Um, you, know, you can't you can't tell us the day afterwards to say, you know, well, this is no good for me. Yeah. You know, tell us now. We need we need to know now. And that's part of the reason why things like the snappy desktop uh, image is being made for 1510 is because we know that 1604 is an LTS. It would be great if people got the 1510 image, tried it out, and said, oh, actually, yeah, we can we can do these things, but then there's this 25% that we can't do. And this is the list of things we can't do. And here are the ways in which, you know, it could be improved. That would be great. You know, we, we need that feedback. We can't just sit in a box and throw it over the wall and say, there you go. That's, that's done. That, you know, that's, that's not going to work. What else did he talk about? He mentioned uh, a certain new uh, flavor of Ubuntu coming into the fold. Called Ubuntu Mate, he said. Yes, Ubuntu mate. <laughs> yeah, that was nice to see. Yeah. I, I think uh, uh, Martin's fallen asleep now. No, I think uh, it's best. Oh, he's I been think disconnected. It's best I don't. <laughs> I don't comment on my oh. own stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> no, that was nice. I I, yes. I appreciate that personally. I I thought it was nice to uh, you know welcome a new flavour into the fold. And I saw uh, today as well. Rick Spencer also mentioned it and actually showed a, a slide. Uh, of Ubuntu Mate Remix, and it was a Power PC screenshot as well. Yeah, it's the Power which, PC port, yeah. Which is even more amazing because there aren't that many desktops that run on a Power PC <laughs> uh, machine. So yeah, that was that was really it nice was, to welcome. It was nice. You know. It was nice to get a mention, and, and more so for the for the recognition of everyone in the com- community that's made it happen, and and we finally got there. So yeah, it was good. It's really cool. And there was there was also a, a hint uh, of a device as well. <laughs> yeah, well, it was a pretty heavy hint. He more did than, say there hint, will be hint, there I will be say. an Ubuntu phone which is convergent this year. Yes. is what he said. So I assume that this is the Maizu phone which we've we've seen no. sort of no no nope. oh a different so a different company a different phone. I think I've said enough, but no, it's, not, it's not the it's not the Maisie phone. Not the Maisie phone. Not, not the Maisie phone. Okay, no, he did yeah. say, yeah, he said that it uh, that they were hoping to be able to release this more widely than they had initially intended to, mm-hmm. which is good. So in more country, it'll be available in more countries. Oh no, that is specifically the Maisie. I think. Oh, okay. He's, what he's talking about there is the Maisie device that it will be available more widely than we originally thought. Oh yes, right. but said then that. but there's also. He, Oh, okay. But there's another device, Ooh. which is um, a convergent device. Yeah, okay. that, that 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 will have some of those convergent features, which is exciting because I'm looking forward to that. It's as well. super exciting oh, because yeah. uh, having qualified the fact that I'm wrong about everything, I had a prediction earlier this year that uh, Ubuntu <laughs> were going to do the convergent thing and beat everyone to it and justify why all these mobile devices are getting more powerful with more memory and more capabilities and bringing a desktop to a a handheld or mobile device is what they're going to do. And I'm dangerously close to being right about uh, some sort of technology prediction here, which is, uh, that'd be a first. Right, well, before I say anything, I shouldn't. I think we should wrap up that segment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Now it's time for Command Line Love. And this week's Command Line Love is List Admin. Yay! Oh, yeah. Sounds exciting. Yay! Oh, yeah. I use it every day. Every Go on then, Alan, what is it? So last week we mentioned that uh, Mailman 3 uh, is now available. Yep. And uh, Mailman... Was that uh, last week already? Yeah, I know. <sighs> time flies. Uh, so Mailman is very popular for uh, managing mailing lists and um, the tools to manage Mailman are a, a bit lacking and that's what they've been improved tremendously in Mailman 3 apparently. Um, but one of the things that you have to do when you're moderating uh, a mailing list is 
um, you have to deal with things like people sending email from the wrong email address, like they email the mailing list from their work account or the wrong Gmail account, or you have to deal with people who send spam to the, to the mailing list and you have to reject that kind of stuff. And there is a web based tool in old mailman pre 3.0. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a bit clunky. It's not very pleasant to use. And that's where list admin comes in. So list admin is a command line way to manage mailman mailing lists. So if you're an administrator of a mailman mailing list, or you think mailman might be a useful tool for managing mailing lists, then list admin is for you. And Unless you're using Mailman 3, presumably. Well, that's unlikely, but, uh, I don't know. I don't know if they, I don't know if list admin, I don't know if the API is backward compatible or not. But anyway, you, you configure list admin with a, with an ini file in which you configure the server where the mail mailing list is, uh, and the moderator's password, which is a bit clunky because that means you've got passwords in plain text in an ini file somewhere on your file system, which is a bit nasty. So be it. It's the mailman then, way. Yes. <laughs> well, yes. Um, and then you just run list admin. And if you're an administrator, you just run list admin periodically, like once a day or depending on the, how busy your mailing list is. Um, you run it and it just presents each email to you and you can either drop it. So it doesn't arrive on the list, which is what you would do with spam. You just press D. Or you would reject it. So maybe uh, someone is trying to send a mail with a huge attachment. So you reject it. And then you can type a line that says, yeah, please remove the attachments or remove your signature or something like that. And then press enter. But it's a super fast way of dealing with all the, for want of a better word, crap that comes into the moderator's inbox if you're a, a <laughs> list admin. Cool. Well, there you have it. That's all the command line love for this week. And now it's time for the news. Galen emailed back. No, again no, it after isn't. We read out his feedback about his. <laughs> no. This is the feedback, not the news. It's not the news. <laughs> oh, the feedback. No, it's, it's, it actually says feedback. Yeah. I'll, uh, <laughs> we were so close I to know, the end. I know. And, and, if, and if we did edits and everything, this would be fine. But okay. And now it's time for the feedback. <laughs> uh, Galen email. <laughs> Seamless. Galen email back in um, after we read out his feedback about his uh, ThinkPad X201 overheating in episode six. Many thanks for saying what laptops you use. Well, I ordered a new heat sink and fan as well as the thermal paste and spent my Sunday morning installing it. I certainly removed a lot more thermal paste than I ended up using. Uh, so the bottom line is it's working again, phew, but I ended up with two screws extra. <laughs> <laughs> I did disassemble it again, but it wasn't obvious where they went. Oh, I'm sure they oh, weren't important. I know where they go. They go in the bin. That's where <laughs> they go. <laughs> they go in the screw drawer for another day. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Little pot o screws. Yeah. Matthew Cucuzela. Hmm. Sorry, Matthew. Keep going. Yep. Emailed us about <laughs> supporting Linux through purchasing hardware. Glad you decided to podcast for another year. You get extra points in my book for being so closely affiliated with Ubuntu and still being very fair and objective. Mm, sometimes. Mm. Uh, in general, <laughs> that's rare these days. Oh, thanks very much. Uh, also, Thanks for your segment on supporting Linux through purchasing hardware with the Linux pre-installed. I'd never heard of Zareason and was glad to hear about another successful vendor like this. My last laptop was purchased from System76. Lately, I've been looking for a big monitor and one of those mini PCs instead of the bulky desktops. I was glad to see that both System76 and Zareason offer these now with pretty good specs. I'll probably buy from one of these vendors soon and agree it's important to support Linux in this way even if it's not the cheapest way to go. I really like the Linux ecosystem, and that's all I run at home. Although at work, we use Windows and sometimes Macs. Eh, that's fine. Thank you, Matthew. That's very good of you to email in and let us know. I'm glad you found another supplier as well. Isaac Carter, mm. uh, also recently uh, appointed into the Joe Rest podcast, emailed in to complain about the music and how he supports Linux. Love the podcast. Would love it a bit more if someone would please change the music. 
No, no, we won't. Anyways, you were asking how we supported Linux. Financially, I support Linux through magazine subscriptions to Linux Format, Linux Journal, and Linux Voice, as well as contributing to most Linux podcasts that I listen to. I use a Mint and Ubuntu Mate on my home machines. I'm also currently learning the Linux kernel to support the kernel code base, as well as learning Python to help support the Mint code base. I have become more vocal at work on why we should start using Linux over Mac. I also encourage friends and family to use Linux instead of Windows or Mac when they decide to purchase a new computer. Excellent. Yet more Ubuntu Mate users. Yeah. Oh dear. The music, Unity better watch out. The music won't change until somebody sits and listens to a whole lot of tracks for, with exactly the right criteria and then does some editing for us. <laughs> and is this some as yet undefined criteria? Pretty much. We, we did yeah. start doing this now because I quite like something a bit more rocky, but then not rocky, but a bit more rock. But then all <laughs> the other podcasts are a bit more rock, so then we wouldn't stand out as much. This is really part of the identity yeah. of the podcast, isn't it? The music. Now. Exactly. Yeah. I, I'll tell you, it I'll tell you something. When I was at the Raspberry Pi Jam, uh, one of the guys there, it was Albert, in fact, he uses the music for this ringtone on his phone because he can be sure <laughs> no that nobody way. else oh. has that ringtone. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I've told this story before, but I'm going to tell it again because there might be people who haven't heard it. Where I worked, uh, four, five years ago, <laughs> I, I was sat at my desk and, um, I, I happened to, I think I actually had the song as the ringtone on my phone as well. And my phone rang and the guy be- who sat behind me, who was a slightly older gentleman went, Hmm, crazy words, crazy tune, <laughs> <laughs> which is the name of the song. <laughs> and I went, yeah. And uh, he actually has a, a vinyl 75 of that song. And, uh, yeah, he listens to it and he enjoys it. And so, uh, that's the first time anyone has ever recognized it, not for being the Ubuntu <laughs> podcast theme tune, but for being what it actually is, a body of work someone made 70 years ago. Yeah. Wow. And so, yeah, I want to keep it for that yeah. reason. I think so. And finally... Nebuchadnezzar left a comment on our website. See, I managed that one fine. Um, to commiserate with Laura about pages reloading in mobile browsers. The thing with the reloading pages annoys me on Android as well. I know the explanation about the RAM already. However, it happens on my Nexus 6 as well, and that's got 3 gig of RAM. I also read that it's a JavaScript thing which forces the site to reload the page. However, disabling it didn't help. I really don't get why this has to happen. I get the loading gig. I get the loading it back to memory, but why reload the page? Does the content not get stored somewhere when the application gets kicked out of memory? Yeah, that's that's a good point. I mean, it sh- I don't know. Okay. Ask a, uh, ask a, ask an uh, engineer. Web, ask a web browser developer person. If anyone knows why uh, pages have to reload on mobile browsers, other than the browser loading, then send us some feedback along with any other feedback to show at ubuntupodcast.org and that's the end of your feedback and that's it for episode 10 we'll be back next week when we'll have more news comments and discussion and by then we'll know who's won our general election Oh, yeah, I'm staying up late to watch that. Me too. I've got half a day after work the next day. Oh, I should probably do that as well. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, okay. Well, thanks, everyone, and uh, see you next time. See you next time. Bye. 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 Bye.